Good afternoon, and welcome to the September 6th meeting of the National Capital Planning Commission. For all in attendance, I know that today's <coughs> meeting is being live streamed on the ncpc.gov website, and there will be an available video in the archives. Now, we do have a quorum, so we'll call the meeting to order. We will proceed uh, with the agenda as it has been publicly uh, advertised. Uh, agenda item number one is report of the chairman. I just want to, I was uh, absent in the last meeting, so I thank my vice chair, Mr. Gallus, for uh, chairing in my absence. And um, we're also, you'll notice the number of laptops around the table. NCPC is moving to a digital meeting, so all of our documents now are um, before us electronically. I'm still old school. I still have have paper documents. Um, agenda item number two is report of the is um, I'm sorry. Agenda item number two is adoption uh, for the commission members. You'll notice that you have the two 2019 meeting proposed meeting schedule at your at your desk. Um, it is as it usually is. Um, there's no meeting scheduled in August, and the January and July meetings are off by one week just to accommodate holidays. So we do need to adopt, officially adopt the schedule. So is there a motion on the 2019 so meet commission meeting schedule? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Uh, it's adopted. So go ahead and be putting those into your calendars. Uh, agenda item number three is report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just note that the staff presentation slide decks attached to the EDRs and shown during our meetings uh, have been redesigned. Uh, many thanks to Paul Jutton for his good work on the template revision, as well as the updated field notes uh, that you have before you. Uh, we hope that the new format is clearer and more readable. And please let us know if you, if you have suggested revisions. You also have a copy of my written report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Acosta? Agenda item number four is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually do have something to report. Um, I, uh, uh, House of Representatives Bill 1220, uh, which is a bill to establish the Adams Memorial Commission to establish a memorial to honor John Adams and his legacy, which his wife, son, and family passed the House on July 23rd of this year. Um, this memorial actually has a fairly long history. It's been in the workings for a while, but it's a uh, uh, time has already expired. But just to refresh your minds, Public Law 10762 authorized the Adams Memorial Foundation, now we're talking about a commission now, but a foundation to establish a memorial to Adams and his legacy. And then follow on Public Law 107315 approved the location of the memorial in Area 1, but not in the reserve. So now the current bill replaces the memorial foundation uh, with this uh, Re replaces, I'm sorry, the um, Memorial Foundation with a commission. It retains the right of the memorial to be in Area 1, but not in the reserve. It authorizes the commission to consider and formulate plans for the memorial, including the nature, location, design, and construction, and it provides a termination date for the commission seven years after enactment of the bill. Thank you. Any questions? That's your only item? Yes. yes. Any questions yes. for Ms. Schuyler? Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Agenda item number five is the consent calendar. We have four items. Uh, item 5A is for approval of the preliminary and final site and building plans for the proposed National Guard Cyber Brigade Readiness Center, which is at Fort Belvoir. That is brought to us by the Department of the Army. Item 5B is approval of preliminary building plans for the Defense Intelligence Agency parking garage refurbishment at Joint Base Anacostia Bowling, and the Navy brings that to us. Agenda item 5C is approval of comments on the draft master plan update for the Marine Corps Base Quantico. Uh, the update was submitted by the Department of the Navy. And agenda item 5D is approval of final site and building plans with comments for multi-use fields as part of the RFK campus redevelopment in the district, and that is submitted to us by Events DC. Are there any questions on any of those four consent calendar items? Hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? No. It's been moved and Second. seconded. All in favor of the consent calendar say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's adopted. Agenda item, uh, moving to the open session. Agenda item 6A 
is um, approval of a request by the Smithsonian to postpone action on the preliminary plans for the National Zoo Park Supplemental Perimeter Fencing until a later date. Uh, the Commission considered this request at their July meeting and postponed action until September now um, so that the applicant could, could provide a security briefing uh, to the Commission and conduct additional public outreach. We received a request from the Smithsonian to postpone action to a future date, allowing them to complete these tasks. Uh, Mr. Gerbich. Thank you. I do have a quick update. So good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I'm here to provide an update on the supplemental perimeter fencing project at the National Zoological Park, uh, which the Smithsonian Institution submitted for preliminary and final review this past July. Um, as you'll recall, the commission postponed action on the project until September and requested that the Smithsonian provide a briefing on security assessments and conduct public outreach through meetings and information with the community and other stakeholders. The Smithsonian has since held community meetings and has submitted a letter requesting more time to consider feedback they've received from local leaders, civic groups, and the public. The Smithsonian has also decided not to move forward with the construction of the central parking facility at this time and has indicated that the postponement will allow them uh, time to modify the, the design of the fence in proximity to the existing parking lots. In light of this update, it's the executive director's recommendation that the commission postpones commission action on the applicant's July submission until a later date per the applicant's request, reminds the applicant per the July commission action that they need to provide a briefing on security assessments and conduct public outreach through meetings and information with the community and other stakeholders, and reminds the applicant to submit any revised materials in accordance with the uh, commission meeting deadlines available on NCPC's website. Um, that concludes the update, and there are, are representatives from Smithsonian here if there are any questions. Are there any questions, any comments among us, or any questions for Smithsonian representatives? Hearing none, is there a motion on the EDR? Moved. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gervich. Thank you. We only have two more items on our agenda, plus an information session, so um, we will move on. Um, agenda item 6B is to approve the preliminary and final site development plans for temporary fencing alternatives at the Potomac Annex in Navy Hill. Uh, that is submitted to us by the Department of State. Mr. Webb. We have one person signed up to speak uh, as well, so we'll get to that public comment period. Welcome, Mr. Webb. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The Department of State has submitted an application for preliminary and final site development plans for temporary fencing alternatives at the Potomac Annex and Navy Hill installation here in Washington. The Potomac Annex is located at 2300 E Street Northwest, a few blocks north of the Lincoln Memorial, and is a federal property generally bounded by 23rd Street, Constitution Avenue, the E Street Expressway, and the E Street Approach Ramp to Interstate 66. The project site for this application is located near the intersection of 23rd and C Streets Northwest. The Potomac Annex has been determined eligible for the National Register of Historic Places as the Observatory Hill Historic District. In 2012, the Department of the Navy transferred administrative jurisdiction of Building 6 and 7 at the Potomac Annex to the United States Institute of the Peace. USIP's campus is shown in this aerial in pink. Navy transferred the remaining portion of the Potomac Annex campus, shown in orange, with the exception of three Navy flag officer houses and associated land to the General Services Administration for use by the Department of State. For the application we are discussing today, the dotted line on this aerial indicates the access road on, on DOS controlled part of the campus where temporary, fence, temporary fencing alternatives will be located and evaluated. As a reminder, in 2016, the Commission reviewed and approved 
USIP's final application for site and building plans for the rehabilitation of Building 6 and 7. Here are images of the approved site plan and the photographs of the buildings as the work nears completion. The addition of an elevated pedestrian walkway between USIP's headquarters and Building 6 and 7 allows USIP visitors access the DOS-controlled property at the Potomac Annex without screening by DOS security. The walkway is shown on the site plan with the dotted circle. At the time of the preliminary review for Building 6 and 7, the Commission noted that DOS intended to construct a fence between Building 6 and 7 and the portion of the Potomac Annex to the north to meet their security requirements. The Commission also noted that the 2012 Memorandum of Understanding between USIP, Department of State, and GSA includes a provision that the parties will consult on the nature, location, and appearance of any fence placed on property controlled by one of the parties. The Commission also advised that a permanent fence must be designed in a manner that is sensitive to the character and setting of the Observatory Hill Historic District. During the consultation for the rehabilitation project, a zone centered on the access road from 23rd Street was determined to be the area to locate a temporary fence to provide security between the two campuses once the rehabilitation of Building 6 and 7 was completed. While DOS continued evaluating the location and design <coughs> for a permanent security fence. This image shows the existing fencing and security conditions as well as the property lines with the access road in the center. USIP's building six and seven are highlighted in pink. The five temporary fence alternatives and the evaluation process will provide DOS a method to analyze, analyze locations for the permanent security fence needed to secure their campus from USIP's headquarters. DOS will include USIP, GSA, NCPC, and other consulting parties in the evaluation process, analyzing a variety of topics included in criteria developed by the Department of State. Once DOS completes the evaluation of the five fence location alignment alternatives, they will quickly submit an application to NCPC for their preferred location for a permanent security fence and will include their evaluation findings as well as the fence design and materials. DOS, DOS proposes to install each of the temporary fence alternatives and then analyze the option using the developed criteria for approximately 30 calendar days. If the alternative fails to meet the criteria, DOS will adjust the alternative's characteristics or discard the option from future consideration. DOS will continue until all five options have been carefully evaluated. They will host site visits with the consulting parties to, re to view the temporary fence location and receive input. The comprehensive evaluation criteria developed by the Department of State includes a range of topics seen here, such as operational cost, construction cost, visual impacts, USIP's life safety, and USIP's vehicular access for support of their plaza programming, as well as trash and snow removal, and MOU requirements. Now, before we look at site plans showing the proposed alignments of the five temporary fence alternatives, I wanted to provide a few photographs to show the access road, which is the zone where the alternatives will be located and evaluated. Here is a photograph looking west with, the US, with USIP's building six and seven to the left and the Department of State's part of the campus on the right. All five temporary fencing alternatives will be evaluated in a zone along the access road seen here. And here is a photograph from the access road looking east. On the left you will see an existing retaining wall and curb line that will be used in several of the fence location alternatives. On the right is uh, USIB's, USIP's excuse me, Building 7. This site plan shows the Department of State's campus to the north of the access road and USIP's headquarters to the south. Building 6 and 7 are, are shown highlighted in pink with the new plaza area between them. I will note that the site plan on the screen includes elements such as turnstiles and vehicular gates that would be installed should this location be selected for the permanent security fence. In addition, the image of the eight-foot ornamental fence is not being used for the temporary fence alternatives under this application. 
For the purposes of this application, we are only looking at the alignment of the temporary fence, which is indicated here by the red line. The first alternative would place the temporary fence along the property line between USIP and the Department of State's part of the campus, which is slightly south of the access road. Now we're looking at the second alternative location to be evaluated, which places the temporary fence along the south curb line at the access road, excuse me, at access road as shown by the red line on the site plan. The third alternative alignment to be evaluated for the temporary fence installs the security fence along the north curb of the access road attaching to an existing retaining wall to the east, which is shown in black. As shown in red on this site plan, the fourth alternative installs a security fence mostly along the south curb line along the access road, then crosses the road and attaches to the existing retaining wall on the east as a sally port. And just for a definition, a sally port is a secure, controlled entryway usually protected by some means, such as a fixed wall. It may include two sets of doors that, that can be secured independently for screening purposes. And the final alternative, number five, which is a variation of the fourth alternative, installs the temporary fence mostly along the south curb line of the access road, then crosses the road and attaches to the existing retaining wall on the east as a sally port, with the alternative gate location being moved further to the west. The temporary fence itself would be eight by 10 foot panels with a black vinyl coated metal frame. The panels will consist of gauge wire coated with black vinyl with two inch mesh openings. Concrete blocks will serve as the fence base and every third fence panel has a pipe kicker with the concrete blocks for stability. In conclusion, the five temporary fence alternative installations will provide the needed security between the Department of State's campus and USIP's headquarters as the rehabilitation of building six and seven is completed. The evaluation process using the five temporary fencing alternatives will help inform the Department of State's selection of a permanent security fence location which will be submitted to NCPC for approval. And therefore, it is the Executive Director's recommendation, recommendation that the Commission approve the Department of State's application for preliminary and final site plans for temporary fencing alternatives at the Potomac Annex and Navy Hill. In addition, staff recommends that the Commission finds that the range of temporary fencing alternatives for consideration is appropriate and the list of evaluation criteria to analyze the permit location is comprehensive. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any question. We have representatives from the Department of State as well. Thank you, Mr. Webb. We do have one person signed up uh, to speak, and that's George Moose. Uh, Mr. Moose, are you here? Please step up. Uh, introduce yourself, and you are here to speak on behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and you have five minutes. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, yes, my name is George Moose, and I have the privilege of serving as Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And we thank you for this opportunity to present the views of the Institute on Agenda Item 6B, uh, Department of State Potomac Annex and Navy Hill Temporary Fencing. This has uh, been a matter of Extensive discussion and detailed agreement between uh, and among the Institute, the Navy, GSA, and the Department of State. Our main message today is that there are ways to meet the valid security concerns of the State Department um, and its neighbors while minimizing the impact to the life safety of the occupants of our buildings and preserving the uses and the views so important to the work of the National Capital Planning Commission. Uh, USIP, as you know, has had a long and amicable relationship with the Commission. Our headquarters building is constructed on land that was formerly a parking lot for the Potomac Annex campus. Uh, during the design process, we consulted extensively with NCPC and CFA staff on and became um, and came before this body twice for reviews and approvals. The ultimate result of that process is a dynamic gateway to the city, a gleaming symbol of our country's commitment.
to peace. Now, uh, following further congressional authorization and after reviews and approvals by this agency, the Institute is completing the renovation and rehabilitation of the two buildings uh, on the Potomac Annex. The restored buildings have been renamed in honor of President George H.W. Bush and President William Jefferson Clinton, who have both lent their personal support to the project and the purposes it is intended to serve. Uh, our work has involved extensive rehabilitation of the buildings with respect to um, the history and the buildings, uh, with, the, with respect for the building's history paramount. Uh, we've removed asbestos and lead, we've repaired roofs and masonry, enhanced foundations, installed new HVAC, audiovisual and communication systems, and we've replaced unsightly exterior fire escapes with attractive architectural features and we have restored historically open porches maintaining uh, the original columns. Um, we have also replaced another surface parking lot between the buildings with a landscape plaza as a unifying element to bring the site together. This plaza honors the peace building work of Senators Ted Stevens and Daniel Inouye, and the new facilities are connected to the headquarters by the John Warner Bridge in honor of his instrumental role in arranging the transfer of the land on which the USIP campus is now located. The plaza and the two flanking buildings will be the site for an international conference uh, just next week, facilitated by the Department of Homeland Security, co-hosted co by the State Department and the Government of Mexico, and attended by foreign ministers and dignitaries from several countries. Preserving the safe and efficient use of the site as well as the aesthetics of this historic location has been a shared goal of state, USIP, the Navy, and the NCPC. And that brings me to the temporary fence uh, uh, issue that is on our agenda here today. The State Department has stated its intention to sequentially install eight foot tall black chain link fences with barbed tops in five locations along the border between the property held by the State Department and that held by USIP. This is intended to be a trial to determine the location of a permanent fence to follow. USIP is on record for some time as being fully supportive of the need for a fence to separate the two campuses. We wish, however, at the outset to register our objections to certain locations that State has proposed for both the temporary installations and the permanent fence. Uh, we have been working on fence issues with the Department of State almost continuously since USIP and State took control of the adjoining parcels of uh, Potomac Annex. We signed, as uh, was previously mentioned, a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding in 2011 regarding our respective uses of the property. Recognizing the importance of uh, historic pr preservation, we worked hard in the MOU to ensure that the fence would cause minimal disruption to use and appearance of the site no matter who built the fence. As the, as the commission is aware, the MOU states that, and I quote, no such fence shall restrict access or usage of, any, uh, of another party or materially increase cost or inconvenience, end of quote. This applies to any such fence, including temporary fences. The fence options therefore deserve the most serious consideration, not only with respect to the preservation and the use of the plaza and the integrity of the Potomac Annex campus, but also with regard to life safety considerations. We welcome certainly the statement made by uh, the State Department at a recent S106 cons consultation meeting that it would not erect any fence that would negatively impact USIP's life safety concerns. However, we do not believe that options one and two, as presented here, meet this test. Either option would seriously compromise the safety of occupants and visitors of uh, the USIP buildings. A fence in either location would block escape and evacuation routes from, routes from the buildings and from the plaza. The fence would prevent access to the buildings and the plaza by fire, police, and EMS teams. And it would also block access to the fire hydrants and fire department connections for our buildings. USIP strongly favors option three as presented in the materials before the commission. Fence option three calls for the fence to be installed 
on the north side of C Street and away from pedestrians and evacuation routes. At that location, it would meet all of the security needs state has appropriately articulated. It would improve the coherence of the campus, protect the appearance and usefulness of the plaza, and allow for the safety of building and plaza occupants and effectiveness of first responders. We have reservations about the proposed options 4 and 4A, but with both having their major presence north of C Street, we do not oppose them as strongly as we would oppose options 1 and 2. We very much regret that the coordination between USIP and the Department of State on the temporary and permanent fence solution has not gone as smoothly as USIP would have hoped, despite the existence of the MOU. Nevertheless, we continue to believe that with a full and objective analysis and discussion, it will be possible to arrive at a solution that fully meets the requirements of all concerned. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Moose, very, very much. Are there any immediate questions for, for Mr. Moose? I have one. Yes. Thank you uh, for your informative presentation. Um, it would be interesting to understand a little better about the location of the fire hydrants that you referred to that would be cut off. Can you, I don't know if you can point to them, if we can. Well, I'm going to, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, defer to uh, the folks who know this better, far better than I, our, both our project lead and our security leads who've been on this project at, since its very beginning. So if I might uh, ask. Uh, Let's step up and identify yourself. And Please. I'm Donna Ramsey Marshall. I'm Managing Director of Facilities and Administrative Services for USIP, and I oversee our construction project. So um, if you have a pointer, otherwise I can just come up. <laughs> hand mic. It's a portable mic. You can. You're welcome. The fire hydrant, which is recently being replaced, is located here just northwest of Building 7. The fire department connection for Building 7 is in this general location near the egress stair. And for Building 6, it is approximately in this location. So the, the one for Building 6 that uh, you just pointed to, is that inside or outside the sally port in 4A and 4P? I, as I'm glad I learned what a sally port is. Uh, but In 4, it would be blocked by the gate or by the fence. In 4A, it would be outside. Gotcha. Thank you. Just to follow up, I'm sorry. The fire hydrant has to be in that location, or is it? The, the fire hydrant is, that's the location where it was at when we located the fire department connections, and they have to be within a certain distance. Sure. That's right. So are there, will there be, oops, will there be bollards on, on the um, 4 and 4A? Will bollards cross the road? Good afternoon. I'm, I'm David Grossweiler. I'm with Department of State. Uh, we had envisioned it being a, a sliding gate, some sort of operable gate so that vehicles could, could clear. It would control pedestrians, but not vehicles. Okay. Going to keep going. Please. Um, so whose idea was it to have five options? Because this feels like a lot of stuff for a temporary fence, and I know what temporary means on this site. Probably not what everybody else thinks about as temporary. But I don't really understand how, the, uh, how, how are, 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 we, are we looking at five separate options and testing everybody, everything out for a half an hour, I mean uh, for, 30, for 30 days because the parties can, can't agree? Is that what we're, why we're going through all of this? Because it feels like, a, 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 once again, an Uti in a field mouse situation? Um, five options. We, we started our consultation in the summer of 2015, and, and part of it was to develop what we should test and what 
what addresses our, our security needs, meets their life safety, meets their meets their MOU requirements. And so uh, it kind of developed and morphed into this where each time we met, we had another alternative that we were prepared to test. And uh, I think part of it was trying to s trying to make sure that we didn't leave any stone unturned. <clears throat> okay, so I'm asking, so, yes, I, I need to understand the process a little questions. Bit. So who's going to be the arbiter of what, you know, this is like a, uh, some, like a beauty contest with several different components. You know, we have the talent segment, you know, so uh, who's going to decide? And uh, uh, I get the criteria, but who's the, who, who gets to decide? I think that's what we're trying to go through the consultation process, Ms. Wright, is that we obviously have issues that we want to make sure are addressed. It is, all of the options are on the Department of State property to be built at the Department of State expense. And so through the consultation, we would solicit feedback and try to make sure that, that whatever option we propose support in the future, we, we can demonstrate that it meets our obligations. And so what happens if at the conclusion of this process, consultation included, because that's not definitive, and, and USIP doesn't agree with state about the, the, the selection that emerges from consultation? That's what I'm trying to get at, because yeah. it feels uh, like it could potentially Wright, be some, a waste of time. Because when they submit for the permanent, they will have to submit their analysis and ultimately whatever that you will still review and approve and if it's their preferred option you may not the commission may not agree with that selection whose preferred option state when they submit for the the when the permanent after they go through the the five options do the analysis based on the criteria including the section 106 consultation input ultimately they will still have to submit for a permanent now, their, their plan would be that this process would inform what they're going to submit for a permanent, but the commission will still have an opportunity to weigh in on those options. I got that part. Okay. Uh, but I don't, what I, what I'm, I'm, that I'm talking about a, the pre-decisional phase, because mm -hmm. it seems pretty clear to me that this is, the way it is because the two neighbors are not seeing eye to eye and I'm not, and so I'm looking at this process as one quite apart from the physical fence mm -hmm. how is this process going to be uh, adjudicate their differences it does this process adequately set up a, 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 um, a situation where we, they ha everybody we haven't gone through all of this right. for to end up at irreconcilable differences. I think it's possible that when Department of State resubmits or submits for the permanent fence, that you will be given you will be given the full analysis, and either or party may not be happy with how the analysis is. Um, they might, you know, as we heard today, um, USIP may prefer one option, find it better for them. Department of State might find another option better. The whole analysis has to come in with the proposal for the permanent fence because this commission needs to make a, recommend, a recommendation on the actual location. Um, so basically what you're being asked to do today is yeah. just approve the process. Right. That, well, and that's actually I will say questions. just to make this, it's a little bit confusing because when there was the approval for building six and seven. They went through the section 106 process. This commission did already approve the temporary fence going in for two years. Right. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it approved it for an area and it was not an approval for a very specific zone and then I think or very specific location. Um, I think originally we thought that Department of State would come in for the very specific location for that two-year temporary fence, but throughout all of this consultation, you've sort of shifted gears and decided to just do this five-month process where you just analyze five different locations, and then they're going to come in with just the location for the permanent. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah, so a question guess. for each of the 
constructed fences to evaluate how much will be constructed oh, actually <clears throat> so we plan on erecting the temporary fence that mr. Webb showed over the length of what you see is part of the length? red line five, correct five so we're, we're proposing to erect the entire the entire length from 23rd and C Street all the way to the I-66 on-ramp and then evaluate how you can see it, how it, how it operates, what are, the, um, what are the problems that it causes in terms of d disruption to operations. Given the, I was going to say, given the two entities involved, the sense of irony here is, is something. Um, it just seems like a lot. Well, that's, that, I mean, that's my point. I, this feels like a, a big to do and frankly kind of a waste of taxpayer money because two neighbors can't get along and can't come to a, a, a conclusion that that satisfies the needs of both. I'm, I, it just feels uh, nutty to me. Well, I think Mr. Moose had a comment. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple of points. As to process, as I mentioned, we have been engaged with State Department over more than three years in conversations about the future delineation of uh, a fence along uh, that would separate our two campuses. Um, one of the things, frankly, that has intervened in those two, those, that period is the change of an administration and the change of personalities and the people with whom we were dealing. Um, we met with the Deputy Secretary of State um, in July uh, to raise with him some of the same concerns we're raising with you about life safety. Um, again, from that meeting, we also indicated from the outset we are in full agreement there needs to be a fence, but it needs to be a good fence. Um, we have in invited people from the State Department to come over to the campus, which they did on the 6th of July, to walk the line and see the various options. Um, and we had expected that that meeting would lead to subsequent meetings and conversations to an analyze the various pros and cons of each of the options that had been put on the table. Regrettably, and as I alluded to in my original statement, that has not happened. Um, we um, had offered, uh, uh, in, in the meantime, let me just simply say, our concern here is that two of the options that have been put forward as temporary fences within and of themselves compromise the safety, life safety, security considerations for the people at USIP. Uh, and therefore, to approve them uh, automatically compromises the concerns that we would have. We believe that they should not even be on the table for that reason. We would also point out that we have not seen, and I doubt that the Commission has seen, a serious analysis of each of those options. And that doesn't require the installation of temporary fences in order to make that analysis. There are aspects of the operational aspects of how these fences would work that I think would help all of us understand better what the pros and cons are. That, to our knowledge, has not been presented to us. So as I said, we, 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 we believe, we continue to believe that uh, a continuation of conversation discussions with uh, between state and USIP, which we are, our entreaties have not been reciprocated, would would and allow us to uh, to arrive at a solution that would meet the legitimate security concerns of the State Department as well as the life safety and other considerations that we have put forward, and that's our our point here. I frankly I would agree with the commissioner. It seems to us one of the things that the state has told us is that one of their concerns is uh, is uh, cost. Well, it doesn't strike me, frankly, that building five temporary fences is a way to uh, save money. We believe that we can arrive at the agreement on a permanent fence without any of that, uh, that trial uh, fencing. And the other concern we have, frankly, is based on some experience that you all may have had as well, is that once a temporary fence goes up, uh, it is for all kinds of other things intervene that may prevent it from being taken down. So our, our preference would very much be to um, uh, have the commission not approve this request as it, as it has been presented today and to create an opportunity for USIP and the State Department to continue discussions with the view of arriving at a permanent solution uh, that would solve and satisfy 
of the needs of both sides. Thank you. Mr. Gallus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A follow-up for the Department of State representatives. Um, this has to do with the life safety issue. I wondered if you could comment on whether you believe it does compromise the life safety issues and are there any other mitigating factors like security that you would point to? And then part two of my question is, um, is there a is there a position from the Department of State about um, compromising life safety issues? Uh, Ambassador Moose was very specific. We we mentioned last week in our consulting parties meeting that we would we would do nothing to prevent them from meeting their life safety requirements. And I think some of it comes down to being a little bit more specific as to what that means. So there are there are details that we've received from the. De uh, district fire and EMS staff as to how to put a, a gap in the fence that makes a hydrant accessible, regardless of whether it's on one side or the other. So th there are ways to make the hydrant accessible to the to the district, and I they forwarded those details to me in March. Uh, the life safe one of the life safety issues that they've brought up is in the event that they need to evacuate the buildings due to a, due to a fire or, or some some event like that and, and a very real and serious event but for them to be able to pull their fire alarm and then have free passage onto our site and and we do have responsibilities to our own staff and visitors and the three flag quarters who reside on the property is is, is the diehard scenario of, hey, if you want to get on the property, you just pull the fire alarm and then everybody can go. So uh, there, are, there are real things that I, that I believe that we're not discounting those. We, we've stated that those are, those are serious life safety considerations that, that we're willing to take into account. But I, I think you'd have to ask them to be a little bit more specific as to what those events are because we're not proposing blocking fire access to the hydrants. We're not proposing restricting the fire lanes. Uh, uh, if anything, we've been trying to make sure that we have updated the campus so that it is more current. And would it be reasonable to expect that part of this testing would involve uh, a full evaluation by authorities, maybe independent authorities, regarding uh, life safety, um, pros and cons, if you will, uh, as part of your process? Yes. Yeah. And last, would it, would it um, be, do we have your assurances that um, there will not be a solution recommended or even temporarily used that in your in your opinion or in your professional opinion or other people's professional opinions that would uh, create a life safety issue for the Institute of Peace yes you have our you have our word that we won't do something which prevents them from meeting their life safety requirements and I think part of that will be a very thorough understanding of what their intent is when they have an event, whether it's whether it's a fire, an emergency for an ambulance response, uh, an active shooter, whatever it may be, uh, understanding how they how they load and how they propose to unload their facility to public space. Well, that seems like a reasonable place to start the discussion because uh, life safety is not something we can compromise any one of us, um, and it's it's actually a legal requirement. And so, uh, and I don't, while certainly there are different maybe opinions about how life safety can be applied, um, it would seem like a reasonable place to start to agree on the life safety aspects of this before moving ahead with options that may compromise uh, life safety issues, since there seems to be a disagreement about that particular point. And it's not a small point. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dixon. Uh, we have the diplomacy of the State Department and the peace groups coming together. I understand you have four, there are four options that are on the table. Is that correct? 
Uh, four and a half, five. Four and a half, okay. Two of them, the peace folk, are okay with this. Am I mis mishearing somebody on that? Two of your Correct. options you're okay with. Yeah. Problem solved. What's the, what's the drill? Well, the, the concern that we have, frankly, is, is in fact the proposal from the state that they will proceed with the sequential installation of all five options. Well, that, I mean, first of all, I would like to just speak as a, a very small taxpayer, very small taxpayer. <laughs> I think that's very, that's just, that seems to be a little bit beyond statesmanlike behavior from the State's Department to just build fences to be, when you know there are two that both parties have some agreement on. I, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm lost with this, I mean, you know, Yes, sir. So some of the evaluation criteria are the operational costs that are associated with each expense, with each bench option. Um, I think one of the benefits of, of the images that you saw showing the, uh, the west view from 23rd and C Street is that the property isn't flat in that spot. And so our current configuration, we're able to screen pedestrians and vehicles at the, at the road entrance. And as people crest the hill and go to other parts of the campus, we've already screened them. They're cleared. So part of what you don't see in the fence alignments is what we, what we anticipate are being some of the operational costs that, that aren't one-time construction costs that they, we, will, we will have until the end of time um, to maintain and, and clear people as they enter through different spots of the campus. Mr. Chairman, I have to ask again. Did you guys recommend the two proposals that the that are be that are acceptable? Did you all recommend those? D did I recommend? Options? I mean, is that part of your recommendation? I haven't recommended it. Four, I haven't recommended well, it. Of, well, of the four, there are two that have been accepted by the other party. Is that correct? Well, three, really. Three. One's preferred. Two are okay, and two are off the table as far as USIP is concerned. Exactly. So two off the table. Right. Yeah. So I, I think one of the difficult things that we've had is that we, we feel like we've only started the consultation. So um, I, would, I, I believe you can come up with some predetermination as to what things look like without actually seeing them built. Uh, I don't know that that works for everybody. I would like to recuse myself and get into the fence business because <laughs> it sounds like to me there's a lot of fence work being done here that may not be necessary. but. Use myself. Well, uh, that, that goes to the point that I was going to make. I mean, why is this something that we have to review and approve in the first place? Because it's a, the total is five months and therefore exceeds some definition of temporary? I mean, this is the sort of thing that if it were the Park Service, we would just do five alternatives and we'd come back afterwards and say, here, this is what we found. I mean, why, why does NCPC have to weigh in at this stage? Again, this goes back to it being very complicated. When, it, when you approve the temporary fence for two years, you approved it for a general location, but you didn't pick a specific line. And so if, because you were, they were not, you need a temporary fence up right now. Is that correct? Yes. Now that the construction fence has come down, you can, I guess there are two options. I guess you could not take a vote and just wait for them to come in in the permanent, but the problem is, is you still need to put a temporary fence up. So instead of picking one specific location, they are proposing to keep it in five different places. So even though it is moving and things are being analyzed, you're saying, okay, that's where the temporary fence is going to be. But we previously had said that it was okay to have a temporary fence in this zone for two in years. The zone. But USIP wanted to know exactly where it was going in that zone. So why is they, that our concern? I mean, I appreciate that well, they have concerns. Well, because we always, but we always, when we approve temporary things and fences, it is usually in a very specific place. But, we don't but, give zones. But what's the definition of temporary in this circumstance? Is it 30 days or is it, it six you months? Gave two it, years. So uh, when we, it was we, approved, you approved a temporary fence for two years. For two years. But it was but we didn't, Oh, sorry. But it, we didn't get it. I mean, th these are, this is five different versions of it that are going, that are going to spend 30 one, days. Yeah. And then at the end of that. They would still need to come in for a five-month temporary fence, though. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So the question before us is, <laughs> is are you okay with this temporary fence in the five locations for five months? They will then come in with a proposal for the permanent location. So the question before question. us is this process, this evaluation the process, process. It's just the evaluation yeah. and being okay with it going in five different places. So can we add a recommendation that in the future we figure out a better process for doing this? Or, uh, I mean, yes, this is I just, would, it just seems silly that the, com the commission would waste. Honestly, I think it, the can was kicked down the road when this came through before because there was no agreement, but they wanted to, we wanted to move forward the uh, building six and seven uh, and finalize that. It was, I think it was just kicked down. Well, and I think that was a perfectly reasonable decision at the time. And I think that if we, if we were to simply say, you know what, if you're going to build it the way we see it with blocks and chain link fence sections, anywhere in there is fine. You figure it out. Come back, back to us with what you think is the right thing. And I frankly wish that's what we had in front of us as the EDR, but I don't want to spend any more time on it. So, do, so wait a minute. But th so this means what you just added something that I didn't, I guess I didn't really get before. So there, this is a, in the absence of the construction fence, now there is no security fence. And so this revolving, you know, fence of the week plan is also serving a practical purpose in the interim. It's not just so that we can study the darn thing, right. which is crazy. I mean, can you imagine if we did a prototype for every single thing we ever did and, oh, well, we got to study it for a month to see if it works. I mean, that's, I've never heard of anything like that. And it feels, I have to say this, it feels like it's coming to the commission in the first place so that we can mediate between two warring partners. And that's a disgrace. So the question before us is the EDR on approval of preliminary and, fight, preliminary and final site development plans, uh, which is basically this evaluation process. Sensing no additional discussion. I just want to get one item clarified, which is that is this only going to be the five months or is this now back to the two years and one of these is going to be in place for two years? No, we asked uh, Department of State that specific question. You have assured us, correct, that after five months you're going to make a decision and bring it forward. No. But then Not it entirely. takes five weeks to submit and get an approval. Well. So. so what we... We're, we're prepared to move quicker. What we were what we were proposing was giving people adequate time to go out there and see how it looked and come up with their own opinion so that they could submit it and we could include it in, in our analysis. So what we had talked about even last week was we, we put it up, let people know. They come out and see it if they would like to. Uh, our security people can see what are the problems that it causes them operationally. How do they have to staff the fence based on where the entrance is or new openings would be in the fence over over its length? USIP would be able to see how it impacts their plaza, how it, how it works with their life safety, and then we would move it. But the campus is so, it has enough vegetation on it that we actually proposed doing it in both winter and summer so that you could see the difference from a visual impact perspective, leaves or no leaves on the tree. Do we need 30 days? Absolutely not. We can move it around quicker. But what's being proposed is, is five options for 30 days each, right? I mean, it, if you have to go through this process in order to come to a conclusion, then I would suggest that what we, you know, we give you the time and you can do these options or you can do other options and that you come back in six months with the decision and not options. I mean, th this is something for the Department of State and USIP to work out, right. not us. Right. So, I mean, I'm fine. Six months, any configurations you want, come back with a decision. I, I would say that as long as we're not compromising or anyone's compromising on life safety. Uh, and we have to be, and, and we'll need some information about that because apparently there's a, a, a difference of opinion here. And uh, okay. there ought to be a definitive answer there. Uh, uh, of course. We would, we would never want to approve something that isn't going to meet life safety requirements. I, I think that's done. But I also think that people's understanding of life safety and the actual life safety requirements are sometimes different. And so that's something that has to be worked out between Department of State and USIP. 
Will six months be enough time with all the stuff that has to happen? I'm not just the, the construction, but the paperwork and all of the stuff. I mean, perhaps mediation <laughs> in order to come to an agreement when, you know, to a preferred, to a mutually agreed upon preferred alternative. Is six months enough time? I don't know. Uh, I, I would, um, I guess I would summarize Ambassador Moose's description that it hasn't, it hasn't been that we aren't trying to resolve this on multiple levels. It, there is in our MOU a dispute resolution paragraph and it talks about trying to work it out at the lowest level possible. Uh, it, it's gone multiple iterations above and uh, even as his description accurately re reflects. Um, so I'm, I, I can't promise that. Well, frankly, I mean, if, it, if it's not six, is it 12? I mean, can you come back a year from now with a decision? You want a commitment that I can come back in well, six months with a preferred alternative? Well, we have to approve something for a period of time, and what we're approving is five months, basically, right? Yeah, but it doesn't have a location. So... Yes. I can make a commitment that we'll be back in six months with a preferred alternative. A mutually agreed upon preferred alternative. Mm. That I, I can't. I, you know, they're the, sub, they're the, the submitting spot. agency. It's up to them. It's not up to it's USIP. I mean, we don't have, you know, the USIP, if they have objections to it, they can come and testify then, but I think it's up to state, state to make land. their recommendation. Uh, Ambassador Moose or uh, Representative, please identify yourself. We'll wrap this up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is William Rothenbecker. I'm the Vice President of Operations and the Security Officer for the Institute of Peace. Um, I would like to speak to the safety concerns, our life safety issues. Yes, we understand that the, um, in addition to the access for fire hydrants and the fire control points and everything else, that is a major concern for us. But of paramount concern for us is the other life safety, and that's the egress out of these buildings in the event of a catastrophe or a major incident. Now, Mr. Grossweiler stated that their concern is access to their campus, and if they pulled a fire alarm, that they would have access to their campus. We are not, as Ambassador Moose stated, we are not objecting to the placement of a fence. All we are objecting really to is options one and two, because it does create a major life safety issue for us, and that's with the egress. We could have upwards of 400 people in those two buildings. It is impractical for us to push those people back into our headquarters building. So the natural would be, would be out to C Street or to Annex Street there and then divert, disperse that way. So you'd want access to C Street so that in the event of an emergency, there's people can come out of 6 and 7 and get to 23rd Street. Yes, ma'am. If no, any of the other locations will provide the protection of for State Department of their flag houses and their property. We won't be able, nobody, none of our visitors can get past that if a fire alarm is pulled. Okay? What it is, is that we're just trying to get out on the C Street to go to a safe rallying point. And that is all we were, that's all we have been ask, asking from day one. We have supported. If we had come to an agreement on the fence, our position today would be supporting a permanent location of the fence if we could have come to an agreement on the fence. And again, as you, as you see in front of you, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, there was four options that were originally. Option 4A was we developed as another alternative at the, the, an original consulting's party, I believe in December of 2016. That's, we come up with option 4A, which we felt satisfied everybody's concerns, all right? In my position, I have to be worried about life safety. I understand everybody else, it's cost and maintenance, but I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna have to ask you the question. At what point does cost outweigh the life, somebody's life? Thank you. Could I ask you one last question? The, so 4A and 4, uh, options 4 and 4A, 
both give you access to C Street, um, but the Sally Port, I gather, is in a different location. Yeah. Right. Yes, ma'am. You could live with either one of those, but you prefer number we, one. We we prefer four A. It, you know, oh, I honestly, you our our, our yeah. ideal you position number three? three is our ideal position. Okay, okay? sorry. I but if up. we're looking, and that's what it seems like, we're you, your charge back to us and State Department is to come back with a compromise. So solution. one and two, you are we're off the table for you because you don't have access to seats. Yes, we feel it's life safety, and okay. whether you create put turnstiles or gates or anything else. State Department still has to control that. We don't have the control of that to open that to allow somebody to get out. Thank you. I know we're not. We're, we're not. We're not picking a, a thing. That's not our charge. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. Of the State Department. First so, last question. So, the is is what's the problem for the State Department on on the two that on on the two. I mean, why include, back to Mr. Dixon's question, why are you pushing for um, one and two and, the, and, and blocking off access to C Street if they, if, is it because you disagree with the life safety analysis or you have security needs that, that, uh, supersede that concern I don't get this this makes no sense to me so we think one and two is the least operationally cost alternative we haven't tested that yet we haven't people have taken a guess but that's what we hope to investigate and determine through placing the fence and then having people actually look at it based how it lays on the land and say truth or not <coughs> and, so you've and, got to man these other to, options there, 24-7 right. with a, uh, at least a one guard at the Sally Port. Is that? Because some of these alternatives, as they crest the hill, you, you lose line of sight right. for, for people. And so, so there is a security perspective, and, and what do you have to staff in terms of clearing people onto the property? So that's why it's a consideration that we are trying to test. Um, th this may be a lot more information than you want, but there, in, in the MOU, there is, there is a way for for us to be aware of their operations and staff the entrances in extended periods of time because we're supposed to have these open Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And in the event that they have events afterwards, if they notified us, they, they, we could staff it appropriately and then we would allow, we would allow the gates to be open in, in the event of these catastrophes. So there is, there is a, a method in our MOU to, to, to work out that expense for these these operations that have to happen afterwards. But we're trying to make sure that it's not just specifically about views or cost, construction or one time, or, or aesthetics. We are trying to capture everything that people were considering as part of the evaluation criteria. All right, so the question before us is this five-month evaluation process. You can like it and vote for it. You can not like it and vote against it, or you can amend it to something something different. Is there a motion? I actually have a question for staff. So, they, I mean, at this moment, all we're approving is five months, right? You're approving no. the five month You're process. You're approving this location for five months. So I right. guess if, the, if the they different. can't come back in in five or six for or the sixth month, and they would submit after five months, then and if it's still not figured out, a temporary fence is going to have to go somewhere. And I hate to say it, but then if they needed to pick a permanent location for the temporary fence for the remainder of their year and a half of the two years that you already approved, that's what would happen. Well, Hopefully, be, we will be back. They will be back with a permanent solution. Wouldn't it be 4A since that's the last one to be tested? Uh, well, well, they. Uh, I mean, really what you're approving is one month in each location, and they need to come in with a permanent solution or a one location for the temporary offense for the remaining year and a half. But it still seems that there's a time lag there that we're missing, right? That they need, they're going to need, they evaluate all for 30 days, and right. then they're at the end of their five months, and they need to and submit. And they're impressed. Well, they, but they need to, even just to submit. Right. Right? That takes five weeks. So... 
Uh, I guess you could add uh, a month or two to the last place that the fence is, whichever, in whichever in order, order whatever order you're going in, you so, can. So, so this doesn't stipulate sequence of options either. It does not. Right. Okay, so can't can't we foresee a, a brawl over that too? Because whichever the last installation is, is going to be the one that stays until the, yeah. the decision is made. Or they, so, I mean, or they can change it back. I mean, these are movable things. It's, it's there's cost, but it's not huge. I mean, my inclination is to to give them the time here. that they need, and any one of these yeah. five is fine, and they can test them in whatever order they want. And they can go back to number three if they want after they've done all five of them to give it a little more time. Just come back to us in a year or less with a solution or six months or less with a solution, just whatever it is. Right. Uh, well, uh, so, I mean, state, you, state said, you said you six would, months. Yeah, you, uh, yes, so you essentially then, I think, are changing the blanket two-year approval that you guys already gave for a temporary fence. You would just say you can do this temporary fence in this these locations for whatever period of time you decide. Um, I, I mean, I know that USIP obviously wants this to be a sh the shortest period of time um, possible, I would imagine. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of USIP, but I think they're concerned that it's going to land in an undesirable location for the two years or for the, you know, for a long time. So. Um, well, I mean, even six months seems like it's very fast, so I would suggest that we go to something like nine months. I mean, again, State had said six months they could come back with a preferred. I think giving them a little bit more time to work out their differences makes sense. And so nine months. Not, not to exceed nine months. Not to exceed nine months. Right. Any one of these alternatives for any period of time within that, I don't know how you put how we need to modify the EDR to say that, but that's what I would recommend. A total of nine months. Without changing the 30 day. Mix, well, I mean, there's some, some, do what something's going to have to be there for more than 30 days. Right. So I, I don't. With authoritative agreement on life safety. Yeah, I, I don't see a need to specify that because they have to do that. But I would say the reason is because it's at least claimed that two of these options violate that already. Yes. That's why. However, I don't believe that state can do anything that would endanger the life safety of people in those buildings. I, they would be, I mean, that would not just be negligent. That would. Costard, do you have a proposed amendment? How about this? Approves the Department of State's application for preliminary and final site development plans. Plans. Uh, for nine months for temporary fencing alternatives at the Potomac Annex and Navy Hill, comma, uh, and ensuring all life safety uh, issues are addressed throughout. So read it one more time. Uh, okay. Uh, approves the Department of State's application for preliminary and final site development plans uh, for nine months. Uh, and we can move that if you want. Uh, for temporary fencing alternatives at the Potomac Annex and Navy Hill, comma, uh, and uh, ensuring all life safety issues are addressed throughout. Say ensures, I think it's ensures. more grammatical. Okay. Uh, only thing, could I, could you say up to nine months? That's what I would say. Up to. Or not to exceed, up to nine months. Up to nine months. Okay. Mr. Cash and then Ms. Just purely on a drafting standpoint, because I do this quite a bit, but I was thinking the same thing, putting it at the end, but maybe to say not for a period not to exceed nine months, that makes it a little bit more precise. If you want to be even more precise from the date of today's approval, but I don't know if that's even necessary, but I think for a period not to exceed nine months gets rid of any ambiguity of what nine months we're talking about. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what a what a active conversation. I just want to make sure that we are not the arbiters also of life safety as well. So if if 
if an issue comes up, I don't know what the process is, but um, I'd hope they don't call Marcel. Um, <laughs> so if there's any clarity, clarification through your MOU or the State Department Fence Association, what that is, we just need to make sure that that protocol is followed and it's not an interpretation by, by NCPC. Last, uh, last uh, word from either of the parties. Could I, could I have a clarification as to I'm, I'm supposed to be back in nine months with a preferred alternative? Is that where, what the proposal is? Yeah. Up to. Up to nine months. Right. I need to be back in front of the commission with a preferred alternative right. based on yeah. how the evaluation has played out. Right. Okay. Does that work? Thank you. Yeah. Ambassador Moose or Shane, any, anything? Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. We, um, let me start by saying uh, we very much regret that you were even having to have this conversation. Our hope had been and our efforts have been along the way to try, in fact, within the context of our MOU to resolve these issues. And the fact that we're here, um, dare I say, reflects, in our view, a breakdown on the side of the Department of State, a lack of responsibility responsiveness to our efforts to engage in this kind of a conversation to try to work through the very issues that you all have been trying to work through today. I appreciate the efforts of the Commission to try to figure out a way to help us move forward. I would simply point out once again, the two of the options for the temporary fence raise the same safety, life security, life safety issues that we are concerned about a permanent and one of the things that we are very concerned about is that one of those fences, one of those two options might in fact wind up being in place not for 30 days. Even for 30 days, it's a compromise. But if one of those options were to wind up there for a longer period, a period of time, it would indeed raise the very concerns about life safety that we have brought to the attention of the Commission. We appreciate the Commission should not have to be the arbiter of those issues. But uh, it seems to me that the Commission would be remiss in approving options when there are serious concerns about what their impact would be on life safety. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. We'll get a chance to, to opine on that at some point. Thank you very much. Uh, sensing no further discussion, is there an, a, a motion on the EDR as amended? I'm sorry, we, we have to amend. The, is there a motion on the amendment? I would move approval of the amendment. I would second. It's been, uh, the amendment has been moved and seconded. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Now, uh, is there a motion on the EDR as amended? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. The EDR is amended. All in, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's the bad. So next on the agenda is agenda item 6C is the approval of preliminary and final site development plans for a new building at the Uniformed Services University and Naval Support Activity Bethesda it is brought to us by the Department of the Navy. Mr. Gerbich, you're back. All right. So uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The U.S. Department of Defense Department of the Navy has submitted preliminary site and building plans for a new education and research building for the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, or USUHS, the Naval Support Activity Bethesda in Bethesda, Maryland. As you may recall, the Commission reviewed the concept design and provided comments at its June 2018 meeting. Uh, this presentation will focus on major changes to, um, to address Commission concerns that were raised during that review. So the Education Research Building is proposed at the eastern end of the NSA Bethesda campus in Montgomery County, uh, which sits adjacent to the Capitol Beltway and lies directly to the east of the National Institutes of Health campus. The location of the proposed building is highlighted with a yellow dashed line on this map. Uh, the location marked here with the purple circle can be seen uh, here in relation to the larger campus transportation network. Uh, you can also see the Medical Center Metro Rail Station to the west, which is located across Rockville Pike. Access is provided to the proposed building via campus shuttle, which is shown here with a gray line. 
pedestrian routes, which are shown in blue, and by automobile, which is shown in green. The campus entrances that provide the most direct access to the site are shown with purple stars along Jones Bridge Road to the south. The map on this slide shows a detail of the proposed location for the um, education research building, along with existing buildings and facilities in the area. To the west is the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute, or AFRRI, and the remainder of the US UHS campus sits to the east. To the north and south of the proposed location are natural areas with mature trees and walking trails. Um, as noted here with red shading, two buildings on the university campus would be demolished to accommodate the new building, as would an existing surface parking lot. This slide shows the overall site plan for the project with the proposed building outlined in yellow and how it would integrate with the University and Research Institute campuses. This site plan has not changed since the concept review um, when the commission expressed general support for constructing the building at this location. As staff noted in the previous review, um, according to the 2013 master plan for the NSA Bethesda campus, approximately 24% of staff arrive via metro, which sits to the west. While, mel while many building users would take the shuttle from the medical center station, uh, others would likely walk to the site along one of the av available um, direct pedestrian routes, which are highlighted here in orange and pink. On concept review, the commission noted that the route along South Palmer Road, which is shown in orange to the south, has pedestrian facilities along its length, while the, road, uh, the route along Stone Lake Road uh, to the north, shown in pink, has gaps in pedestrian connectivity. The co this concept rendering shows an aerial view of the building from the southwest. Uh, the primary building access is seen from the eastern plaza near the center of the image, with a secondary entrance off of the western terrace highlighted in blue. The commission noted in its previous review that there was not a clear pedestrian connection from the sidewalk along South Palmer Road onto the terrace and into the building. Uh, as can be seen here in orange, the existing and proposed sidewalks would instead provide access to the building through the main plaza. The commission requested that the applicant improve pedestrian access along South Palmer Road by extending the sidewalk onto the proposed terrace. So this updated rendering shows the revised building design at this location, which indicates a more direct connection from the existing sidewalk onto the terrace and into the building's western entrance. Uh, staff finds that this modification would improve pedestrian connectivity to the building from South Palmer Road. The commission expressed similar concerns with connectivity along Stone Lake Road during concept review, which can be seen here. This pink line shows the primary pedestrian route at this location, which the commission noted has no pedestrian infrastructure along the roadway and gaps in pedestrian access. The commission requested at that time that the applicant enhance connectivity at this location to provide more direct access to the site. Um, this refined design can be seen here, which shows a more pedestrian-friendly connection to the building, including a new sidewalk and a crosswalk that provides safe access across the building access road. Uh, staff finds that this new sidewalk, which is currently under construction, will improve pedestrian access from the central NSA Bethesda campus and the Medical Center Metro Station to the west. During the concept review, the commission noted that the proposed central plaza included a significant amount of hardscaping in an area that will likely have extended periods of direct sunlight and requested that the applicant consider enhanced tree cover and vegetation to provide shade relief and counterbalance the hardscape. The refined design, which is shown here, shows more landscaping along the plaza, including several planter boxes to accommodate new trees as well as expanded planter beds that also serve as stormwater bioretention. The applicant has indicated that the depth of the planter boxes and the height of the trees are actually limited at this location because of a subsurface radiobiology lab proposed as part of the project. Um, I'll show this change one more time. I'm gonna go back and show you the concept and the preliminary again comparison. Um, another view of the previous concept design can be seen here, which is from the existing US UHS facility to the east. 
And the refined design can be seen on this slide, which again shows more vegetation and trees that serve to break up the hardscape. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show this one one more time as well. This was the concept design in this location. And then here is the refined design. This slide provides a view of the Western Terrace, which has also been modified with expanded landscaping, including tree boxes along its length. Planter depths are also constrained at this location due to the parking garage structure below. Staff recognizes that the proposed trees on the plaza and the terrace will provide only minimal shade due to the size and depth of the tree boxes that can be built in these locations, but notes that the applicant has worked within limitations to increase the amount of landscaping to the extent practicable. Staff requests that the applicant continue to consider opportunities to, um, to introduce more landscaping as site conditions permit and to expand seating and shade relief for pedestrians. Uh, while the commission expressed general support for the proposed design and review of the concept, um, it did express concerns with both the amount of glass on the western facade of the building and the stone materials proposed for the western entry, both of which can be seen in this rendering from the previous design. The commission noted that the stone looks as though it would absorb and radiate heat, creating an uninviting condition for pedestrians. To address these concerns, the applicant is proposing the modification shown here, which features a brick material palette that is consistent with other materials on the building facade and is intended to better manage the heat effects of direct sun exposure. I will go ahead and show this one again as well. Here's the uh, previous design and then um, the refined design here. Uh, similar materials are also proposed for the plaza on the eastern side of the building, um, as can be seen here. Again, this was that, uh, that lighter stone color before. Um, on concept review, the commission had also informally noted that the previous design, which uh, featured shade fins, would likely be inadequate to reduce sun exposure on the western building facade. Um, this submission includes refinements to the glazing system, which indicate that transparent glass will be um, interspersed with spandrel panels to, show infil or, um, to reduce infiltration of direct sunlight, showing a window-to-wall ratio of 50% here along the western side. Uh, this rendering of the interior lab space on the western side uh, shows that adjustable roller shades would be provided to further screen excess light. Um, in conclusion, it's the executive director's recommendation that the commission approves preliminary site and building plans for the education and research building at NSA Bethesda, finds that the applicant has improved pedestrian access to the western building entrance, including a sidewalk from South Palmer Road onto the terrace um, and a crosswalk along Stone Lake Road that connects to the rest of NSA Bethesda, Notes that a radiobiology facility will sit below the um, eastern plaza, which restricts the depth of planters and heights of trees. Uh, commends the applicant for working around the development constraints to increase the amount of landscaping on the site. Requests that the applicant continue to consider opportunities to provide more landscaping as site conditions permit. <coughs> Uh, notes that the transparent glazing on the western building facade will be interspersed with spandrel panels to reduce the infiltration of direct sunlight, and that interior roller shades will be, will be provided in lab spaces. And notes that the material palette for both the eastern plaza and building approach from Stone Lake Road has been altered to relate to other materials on the building facade and to better manage the heat effects of direct sun exposure for pedestrians. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions, as are um, members of the project team. Thank you, Mr. Gerbich. In the absence of the chairman, he's asked me to step in. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation, John. Um, on slide number 13, I don't think that the ivy and the, like, baby bushes are worth it. I wouldn't call that landscaping. Like... It it's actually seems very pedestrian, and I'm, I'm sort of concerned that that's what we're encouraging. Yeah, number 14. 14. Like, you know, I'm not a fan of the, um, of the big umbrellas and the little chairs out, but I, I'd rather have them figure out a, a programming way with sort of movable things and public art or something like that than, say, put in vegetation, because if the intention for that is sort of heat islands or the intention for that is for shade, 
it doesn't meet any of the criteria that we're asking for. And so if we can, if they can pinky swear to put out big umbrellas, you know what I mean, or you know, a spray park or something like that, I'd rather have them do that than see this. Like, I just... So, so this is a this is actually a preliminary. It's so not preliminary and final, and we will um, see this again. Um, we did get an opportunity to speak with uh, folks from NAFAC who had indicated that this is a true thirty five percent design, and that they do plan to do a lot of refinements. And we did speak particularly to what you're suggesting with some programmatic approaches to potentially uh, managing some of that. And they have indicated they're they're considering some of that. I don't know if anyone would like to speak specifically to that, or or if that's kind of captures it. Okay. So that's where we are with that for now. Other comments? Well, yes, I have comments. Um, could you go back to that slide where we look like, you know, we're approaching something that ought to have a moat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> I don't understand this. Um, why anybody would design a building like this. Um, this being a pretty significant approach sequence, right? This is this is technically the secondary, well, and I mean, really the third approach to the building. The main is, is across the front part of right. the building and the central plaza. This is kind yeah, of yeah, but you just access. did right. went through some, you know. They've improved some access, yes. So it is a little more direct. Right, but I mean, if you look at the circulation map, it. They, they, I, 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 I wonder what's behind this big. Um, this looks like something that that is is hiding a skiff or something, and I guess that's cool. If but I would like some kind of explanation. Why would you pr make this, you know, the 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 entrance sequence? I just don't get that. The the and this big fortress-like wall. Can you toggle back to the concept? I mean, it's better, I guess, if you think a change of material is better. I, I do think it works better in the, in, in the current incarnation. But still, I, I wonder, is, is, is there somebody who can explain this? Is there a big laboratory back there that can't have windows? Or what, what's back there? Parking? <laughs> So well, parking, this, you could punch 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 holes in the wall. So that section, actually, this. Um, Please identify yourself. Oh, sorry, Nick Tompkins, Flag, NAFAC, Washington. Um, so this actually, this tall wall is actually screening mechanical equipment. Um, so it is open behind that wall. Um, so that's why there can't be punch outs. What do you mean open behind that? So wall? so that's stair, a screen. Yes. Yeah, so that wall, that's actually a separate wall. You have the stairs that come up, and then there's a wall that makes the wall of the stairs, and then there's mechanical equipment behind that. So if that you blew up this to. slide, are there is there texture to? I see some ver vertical striping, but I didn't know what that was. Yeah, that's just the texture of the brick itself. So, and the majority of the circulation that's coming to use these stairs is going to be coming from these parking spaces that are along the road. So, so this, so your architect has said to you, well, this is back of house, uh, pretty not, much. Not exactly. It has to do with. Well, um, that's what it looks like. <laughs> okay. I mean, and think about the lovely trip one's going to have as you're huffing and puffing up 40 or 50 steps while you have the mechanical plant right to your left, um, you know, chugging away and sputtering and spurt. I just don't, that makes no sense to me. No, and I'm not even talking about. Uh, aesthetics. I'm talking about a pl from the pl a planning perspective why why one would do this. I mean, I don't expect you to answer, but I do expect you to ask your architect because this is not a smart way to do a building. I Number believe one. it has to do. Number with the two, the the you know we I think we 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 made a big fuss, and again there's been some changes, but you know Venetian blinds don't exactly cut it for 21st century technology. What we're going to give everybody in the lab a remote, and that's supposed to make it oh well we've got the solar heat gain stuff handled. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So in regards to the solar, we do have samples of the glass. If you would like to see them, that we can pass around there. 
I believe you. I, I believe that you have probably tempered glass and all that stuff. I just, I, I think somebody really needs to put the architect's feet to the fire here because they, there, there's some changes, but they're kind of, they're not um, substantive changes. It looks a little better, and yeah, you're still at concept, and we're the planning commission, so I'll shut up now because it's not we're not CFA. But wow, I'd really push your architect hard. Okay, I'm finished. If I may, <laughs> uh, and I think to keep this up if you don't mind. Um, really, I, I appreciate the you know kind of clear articulation of the spandrel panels. Uh, to sort of does minimize the glass. Um, I had a question about the, the vertical members that are moving. I can see them sort of to the left of this image, and I think they're also uh, in existence on the right side, the more western direct focus. Um, what are those? What is that material? Uh, yeah, but that's not this wall. It's It's... The Western exposure. Um, Heidi Chan, also with NAFA Washington. Yes. Um, so that would be the opaque glass. So there's actually three different types. So you have your clear visions, you have the spandrel, and then the opaque version. Okay. So what what it feels to me is that this building was designed because it's a beautiful building, and um, and it the idea the design idea was to make this facade, for whatever reason, uh, a glass facade, okay, which could be beautiful in the right location. I just feel like the other facades, which aren't challenged by solar gain in the way this this facade is, um, it's almost a, a, it's backwards, in my opinion. Um, that the, the the combination of brick and glass in the other facades would be a better response on this facade because it's the western facade. And I do have to say that 22 uh, really hurt when I saw it. I mean, I, I, <laughs> go ahead, put it up. It, right. it, it, I, make, make it hurt, Mr. Gerbich. Make it hurt. Uh, this was sort of felt like, and, and I don't know, I guess you paid someone to do this because this is a rendering. So I'm really sad about that um, because if that's the best we can do um, in thinking through a, a building that is a very expensive building, hundreds of millions of dollars this building's going to be, and it's going to last for a long, long time. And they say, oh, roller shades, there's the solution. This is the best we could come up with in 2018. So, again, I, I hope you hear us. I think there's a, a, a love affair with <laughs> this design that is misguided, um, and I hope that we can see some improvements going forward. Thank you. And yes, is in love with the design so much that these changes are in, are incremental, and what you, what is called for is maybe not a cardinal change, but something that's not incremental either. It's a different design idea. And this seems like appeasement rather than <laughs> really thinking about it. Thank you. Other comments or questions on this? Mr. Shaw, I just have one more, Mr. Chair. Is since we are the, the planning commission as well, I'm tr trying to be a planner lately, is if we look towards the future for the master plan, is is the new building always expected to be the edge or to be the center? So as things start to go, this looks like it's in the center and we're treating it as an edge. And so how do we, I look even now, the sidewalk doesn't continue all the way back up I'm in those instances. And so I just, I want to make sure that as we, you know, there's still some green space right there. I see some parking. There's 47. The relationships may change for some of this kind of stuff. That, you know, I, I would I would want to understand how this is how this fits within the, lar the larger context of the master plan. 
um, and not just in relation to the to the medical school, but also to the to the to the part that's to the east west, west yeah. to the west, the other side. So just right now, like it's being treated as an edge, but it's actually in the center. And then given the other surrounding opportunities for development, you know, how do how do we start to position this to be relevant? Um, to the larger mission of the campus and larger mission of the plan. So that's just some maybe some other information on the design or on the programming that I would I would recommend. I mean I can provide I guess a little bit of context. The to the north and the south I think those are intended to remain um, open space. They do have walking trails, they are mature trees. Um, and in fact they considered some alternate locations for this building that were in those locations previously that the commission had um, had you know indicated that they were not supportive of. Um, and I do know I think the attempt to kind of um, bridge that gap that you're talking about between kind of the west and the and the central location here. Um, they do have um, walkways that kind of go between the two. Um, but I think that as it's part of the USUH campus, campus to the east, I think they wanted it to kind of be oriented that way, but to, still to provide some connectivity to the west. Um, but um, just a little context as well. It, it does read like the center and not the edge, if you look at the, the larger planning context of the campus as a whole. Mr. May, did you have something? Yeah, I'm going to keep it short in the hopes of not repeating things already said. Um, I share many of the concerns that have already been voiced. Uh, I would say that um, just in general terms, the changes to the facade uh, have been an improvement. I think that the, the it has gotten a little bit better in that regard. It's a little bit um, more unified. Uh, in terms of the design, the way the, the building as an entire composition is coming together. Um, I do have to completely question, and this is a, I think there's a planning consideration, the, um, the approach that we see on slide 16, at least on my presentation. I mean, it, no, it's not that one. It's the, it's the, the rear entry point there, yeah, that. So, I mean, that, you know, the materials got better there, but the, the whole idea that that's how people would get into the building, I think, is problematic, especially when you look at it in just even, uh, there's, a, there's a higher elevation view of it that's, uh, that was in our, our initial package that shows the screen wall with the, you know, by the mechanical. I, I just have to question why anybody would want to make that slog up the hill like that. And so it, it calls into the question that, you know, how one enters the building from there. I mean, this is a, the purpose of this is to connect to the plaza so everybody can go in one door. Or is there is there an opportunity to actually put a door at a lower level so people can go into the building at the lower level? Or is it all just mechanical? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a path that leads to a space between the, the sort of the gray portions of the building. Um, in other words, I think there may be a way to solve the problem of people getting into the building um, that don't involve sort of putting different wallpaper on what we are seeing here. I mean, the, this is better wallpaper than the first version, but it's still, it's still wallpaper. It's not fixing the problems that lie beneath. So, Is, uh, is that on-grade entrance uh, up that up that road looks like it has a slight yeah. ramp I'm you mean to the left of no. behind the cars the, yeah. the exiting yeah. cars just to the left of the stairs you're talking yeah. about here no to the right of the stairs or, up yeah. the up the exit road underneath oh the access road there oh, oh, so wow. that's this is a service um like kind of a service entrance through here and i believe it's going to have access to the subsurface parking garage as well no no i guess i guess no <laughs> That goes to the mechanical room. The mechanical room is not in that corner right there. To the right, the access road, though. Yeah. Not, to, the, not, to, not, to, not the ramp to the left, but to the, the road. Can you use, use the pointer on the right? screen? Thank you. <coughs> yeah, uh, just up there. Is, is that one-grade entrance right there, or what is that? 
There's no entrance there. Those are just windows right there? Oh, those are right for the garage. So oh, those the are the two level garage that you're seeing. Okay. Slide 17 so, shows the elevated where you can see it, at least in our packet. Yeah, I don't have that in the presentation, but. Oh, sure, I got it right. Packets. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's clearer. Thanks. So can we, can, can you pull up the image that was in 17, the aerial view from Stone Lake Road? Is that in your presentation um, anywhere? It's not in the presentation. I think if I can grab it from somewhere. <laughs> okay. There's not a way to put it up, is there? So I, I'm looking at the image that we had received in advance, which is slide 17. So if anybody has it on their computer, they can see it. But yeah. what this... Are you looking at the same thing I'm looking at? Yeah. Slide 17? Yeah. So the, 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 I think that there needs to be some examination of how people get from that lower level into the building itself. Yeah. And I think that what's being proposed here in terms of the, you know, the um, scaling the Great Wall uh, <laughs> to get to the, you know, the, the sun-baked, not even the plaza, it's just this connector. I, I, I think that whole concept should be revisited. The and grappling the, hook comes with your remote for the shades. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, you, you could look at actually having a path alongside the building and, and maybe make that whole service road a little bit more attractive. And there could be, you know, trees along there. And then you can, you know, you have a nice walk up along grassy yeah, the school is on hill. That side. Well, it, but there are people coming from below. So. You know, it almost, it almost well, it, feels like that big connection. staircase. I mean, like this, this, um, this outdoor terrace thing is <clears throat> the, the 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 architect is conceives of that as as the reason for all this other kind of inadequate. It's accessories. An, it's, an entry it's like this. Sequence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. The, the, but so it's almost like, well, once you get up here, if you don't pass out, this is going to be so wonderful that you'll forget what you had to do to get there. And it's just not yeah. going to work. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess it, it, it's just a, f I think there needs to be a fundamental reconsideration. There we go. That's Got the it. Image. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that. having people walk up five long flights of stairs. Where is the primary entrance to the building? It's, around the it's on the other side, right? Yeah. What, what, what percentage of the students, where the main school is, where the main area is, and where that other plaza is, which is the predominant side of the building because that's where the students are, what, 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 uh, what percentage of the entrance do we think is there, and what percentage are coming from these back auxiliary couple parking places? Um, I can't give you exact percentages, yeah. but the majority of the people who would be using this entrance is only the parking from that road, yeah. um, which is not no. very so, much. I, I, um, the, I USU, the USU campus is pretty inward looking. The, once they're on campus, they're pretty much on campus. They're coming between the different buildings and this would be the outside of that campus. So they would be typically using the other side of the building and then coming through the plaza entrance. So I, I, I'm suggesting this because I'm thinking you can save some money by not even bothering with this sort of entry sequence. Yeah. And that you just need to have a, a door somewhere that's near, closer by for those handful of people who are coming from the cars that are parked down there. And I just think you, you know, most of your problem goes away. Mm -hmm. And you can treat this as back of house space the way it is rather than trying to make it into exactly. something else. Just let it be that. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and then other than that, now that we've beaten that horse to death and I'm going <laughs> to talk for just a little bit, the plaza really, really does need more work, and I think the trees and the little planters is just not enough. Uh, so, um, and, and I assume that there's a landscape designer on the team. Yes. yes. So um, I, I would ask them, I would give them a little bit more freedom and ask them to try to do something that's more integral to the design of it. Because um, this is, you know, this is just, it might be okay for a little bit, but it's not going to age well, and it's still not enough green. So, thanks. And I would recommend that you have the architect come with you next time, because we're putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, and and they should feel a little heat for this. 
I, really, they should because it's have they're not they haven't been responsive to the comments and 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 or or and if this is what's considered being responsive to comments, then that's a real problem as you go through design development. Chairman Kaiser, okay. I'll beat this little dead horse a bit more. Could you go to <laughs> actually to slide eleven? I've, I was just flipping through. Could you go to eleven now? We have the full one. Yeah. So not only is that staircase, which here would be in the upper left, it doesn't actually even connect to the plaza. It literally like is a stairway to the sidewalk on that little service entrance. It looks like. So now I'm even more confused. I mean, because yeah, so you can see like that little the bridge in the back left side of the building there. You come up that giant staircase, and then it just ends there at the road and doesn't even ever seem to come around to the plaza. So, I mean, the utility of it seems to be able to get you from the parking lot to this other street. So I would just, in looking at the other side of it too, I think that kind of even takes it a level further that we're not even using this as an access to the plaza. It's an access kind of just back up to the street. So I would just kind of use that to expound on those points. But there is a western entrance on that terrace yeah, into the building. Yeah, so, like, I, I can't show you with a pointer, right? Oh, I can't. Okay. Uh, right here is an entrance to the building. Oh, yeah. right. So it doesn't connect to the plaza, but it does connect through the building. So I think all, all the more reason to saying that if you're going to have that as the back entrance, actually have it kind of on the back side rather than having that big staircase to a minor entrance, which is kind of all that space there. Okay. Any other comments? Hearing none, the EDR is before you. This is preliminary. So, all in favor? Is there a motion on the EDR? So moved. Is there an enthusiastic second to the EDR? <laughs> second. Writing second. Been, How about been, that? It's been moved and seconded. Uh, without, Conditional second based yeah. on will you get your architect to do their job? That kind of second? Yeah, grind your teeth second. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's been moved and seconded uh, without amendment. Uh, all in favor of the EDR say aye. Opposed, no. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure they look forward to seeing yeah. you. That ends the action items. We have one information presentation on the monumental uh, course uh, streetscape project. Um, get to the right page. It's an initiative by NCPC is leading in coordination with the some other federal and district agencies. Ms. Spiegel is here uh, to present the urban design streetscape framework that will inform subsequent phases of the work, including streetscape guidelines and construction and the construction manual. Ms. Spiegel, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The Physical Planning Division is providing an information presentation on the Monumental Corps Streetscape Project. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide a brief recap of our May information presentation on the Monumental Corps Streetscape Project, which is a multi-phased update of the 1992 Streetscape Manual led by NCPC, and to request your comments on three components of the project a proposed adjustment to the 1992 streetscape manual boundary, the proposed urban design streetscape framework, a planning framework that categorizes special streets that are part of the Monumental Corps' public realm, and lastly, the proposed components for the conceptual lighting framework. Now I'll provide a quick recap on the project background. The Monumental Core comprises federal lands on either side of the Potomac River. However, this project's focus is the symbolic center of the city within the vicinity of the National Mall. As the city has expanded to the south, this area, the National Mall and surroundings, is no longer at the edge but is now at the center of an expanded downtown. This project will help make more natural and intuitive connections across the National Mall and tie the capital city together through its public realm and streetscapes. To review highlights from our May presentation, the Streetscape Manual was first created in 1992 when the Secretary of Transportation initiated the Interagency Initiative for the National Mall Road Im Improvement Program. The 1992 manual was intended to provide guidelines for coordinated and consistent streetscape treatment on roadways in the vicinity of the National Mall, and the manual was developed and managed by a working group, 
that originally included the parties that you see here on the left, but later in 2005 included the endorsers you see on the right. The 1992 manual consists of details and specifications that help to coordinate construction within the boundary shown here in the dashed black line. The working group achieved great outcomes using the 1992 manual and collaborated on over 25 projects that rehabilitated and reconstructed roadways in Washington's Monumental Core, achieving streetscape consistency across jurisdictions. Recently, the working group identified the need to update the 26-year-old manual, and now is a good time to do this since there are no major roadway improvements anticipated in the near term. Staff completed an assessment of streetscape planning documents and existing conditions to inform our scope of work. And some examples, some good examples, and a number of issues are shown here. <coughs> Staff identified several problems, which can be summarized as a lack of streetscape guidance, particularly at a level that connects the construction details with the broader vision. This is especially true for emerging issues like stormwater management and changing technologies and a lack of thorough streetscape manual application, administration, and coordination. Within Washington's Monumental Corps, streetscapes reinforce its unique role as the nation's capital and create a welcoming and livable environment for people, reinforcing a civic quality that inspires people and cultivates a sense of pride, permanence, and dignity. Therefore, the Monumental Corps is a place where these details really matter and its streetscapes should meet elevated standards. In May, staff presented the scope of work to our commission and the Commission of Fine Arts, which included four products that will be useful to different audiences. First, the Urban Design Streetscape Framework, which you're about to see today, will be useful to planners and urban designers. Second, the Streetscape Design Guidelines will be useful to, de to designers and architects. The Construction Manual will be useful to facilities managers and construction workers. And lastly, an update to the Memorandum of Understanding will improve working group coordination. Together, these documents will form a comprehensive streetscape guide. It's important to note that the guide is not intended to be a capital improvement program. It will provide guidance during project development and project review with the goal of developing streetscape consistency through incremental change. As we proceed with the Monumental Core Streetscape Project, we're focused on several goals and priorities, which include creating a distinguished and accessible public realm, maintaining a vision for streetscape and public realm design, connecting reservations and civic spaces within the Monumental Core to the rest of the city, and reinforcing the form and identity of the city. Now that I've wrapped up the overview, I'll talk about the proposed 1992 boundary adjustment to better reflect planning re rec uh, recommendations and respond to changing conditions. This diagram illustrates the 1992 Streetscape Manual Boundary, which focused on roadway rehabilitation and reconstruction projects in and around the National Mall. We'd like your feedback on adjusting the 1992 boundary to include the Kennedy Center, Banneker Park, and Judiciary Square. The Kennedy Center is currently expanding southwards towards the National Mall and offering new connections to pedestrian and bicycle trails along the Potomac River. In addition, the Monumental Core Framework Plan of 2009 proposed extending the National Mall by connecting the Kennedy Center to the south and east and strengthening and reinforcing the link linkages between a President Kennedy's living memorial, the White House, and National Mall. NCPC met with Kennedy Center staff who expressed initial interest in being included within the boundary. The project offers them an opportunity to improve coordination with their neighbors and their visitor entrance experience, which has challenged access and visibility. Southwest Washington is transforming with the opening of the <coughs> wharf, which opened this year, and the International Spy Museum, which is expected to open next year in 2019. This is changing how people use and experience this part of the city. In addition, the Southwest Eco District Plan of 2013 recommendations include reinforcing Banneker as a gateway between the National <coughs> and Southwest Waterfront, which is happening with the new pedestrian access improvement project completed earlier this year in, in the spring of 2018. 
In response to changing conditions, future streetscape enhancements could strengthen the gateway experience and reinforce these linkages. LaFont originally planned Judiciary Square to be the seat of the Supreme Court and had established views to and from the site. It is now a prominent location within the city with federal and municipal courthouses and the National Building Museum. Judiciary Square is currently under construction with the National Law Enforcement Museum and is expected to open this fall, becoming a new visitor destination in close proximity to the mall. Future streetscape enhancements could strengthen the identity of Judiciary Square and its relationships to other destinations, including the mall, Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House, and Union Station. So next I'll discuss the proposed urban design streetscape framework. Today we're seeking your comments on the streetscape framework, which includes street categories, character areas, streetscape elements, and gateways and thresholds. And I'll walk through each of these components one by one. First, I'll start with the street categories. The street categories organize monumental core streets according to their national and local identity and spatial and visual relationships to nationally significant monuments, memorials, buildings, or open spaces. These categories include radiating and edging streets, which you see in magenta, connecting and traversing streets, which you see in light pink, and local streets, which are shown in white. I'll note that some of these streets connect to parks and other destinations outside of the 1992 manual boundary, which is shown here in dashed gray. And we are working closely with the District Office of Planning and District Department of Transportation and have developed a refined scope of work to study these streets and determine how to coordinate federal and local guidance. We're also forming an extended working group, which includes city staff, to focus on these streets outside of the 1992 boundary. To further describe the street categories, radiating and edging streets are those with national importance and symbolic meaning, which radiate from or edge or nationally significant structures and open spaces. And you see an example here of Pennsylvania Avenue. Connecting and traversing streets are those with national and local importance and symbolic meaning, which connect multiple nationally significant destinations and open spaces. And then lastly, local streets, which are the orthogonal grid streets that support and highlight the other radiating diagonal avenues and provide access to city destinations. So character areas are the second component. Character areas and sub-areas describe the unique land use, urban design, architectural, and landscape character within each precinct or neighborhood. There are 10 character areas shown here in different colors on this map. These areas represent distinguishable patterns in the built environment, not jurisdictional <coughs> boundaries. And the character areas, including their buildings and yards, form the backdrop to the streetscape. Here's an example from the U.S. Capitol Complex showing the legislative precinct with the U.S. Capitol building in the foreground and some images of unique streetscape details that are noticeable to pedestrians. Next, I'll discuss streetscape elements. We recognize that there are many different elements within the streetscape and many of these are included within the 1992 manual. We've categorized these into vertical, surface, and small-scale elements and organize them along a spectrum of consistency with the most consistency desired at the top and more variability uh, permitted at the bottom. Consistency among the vertical elements such as the street lights and street trees, shape streetscape corridors and frame vistas and view sheds. Consistency among surface elements such as the pedestrian walking space and pavement materials strongly inform streetscape character. And the small-scale elements like furnishing signs and perimeter security may have more variability to adapt to character areas and neighborhoods. The streetscape framework synthesizes these various components. This composite is the streetscape framework showing the relationship between the street categories and the character areas. As previously mentioned, the character areas form the backdrop to the streetscapes and have an influence on the pedestrian experience. So for example, Constitution Avenue edges and, and crosses through the U.S. Capitol Complex area, the Mall Museum area, the Federal Triangle, Northwest Rectangle, and West Potomac Park. 
And these character areas are distinct. Some are more urban, some are more park-like, but since Constitution Avenue is a radiating and edging street, it should be highly consistent as it travels across these five areas. And I'll further illustrate the framework with a few examples. So here's a viewpoint of Constitution Avenue where it edges the National Mall and Federal Triangle. It's a streetscape that should be balanced and symmetrical and rhythmic to shape the streetscape corridors and focus vistas and view sheds. To tie the capital city together, it's important for these streets to have a highly consistent, symmetrical, and unified streetscape. So on radiating and edging streets, vertical surface and small scale elements provide the desired consistency to reinforce the identity of the capital city. Some elements, however, like perimeter security, can vary to reflect architectural style. Here we have F Street as an example of a connecting and traversing street. This is connecting the U.S. Treasury Building to the Portrait Gallery through downtown. To unify the capital city, it's important for these streets to have consistent elements, but their character should also be informed by the areas that are, they are set within. So there's a bit more variability on these streets. On connecting and traversing streets, vertical and some surface elements provide the desired consistency, whereas small scale features can vary to reflect the character area or neighborhood. And the, those are shown in orange on the diagram. C Street Southeast is an example of a local street just outside the U.S. Capitol Complex on the south side of the Madison Memorial Building. While these streets do have their own unique character, it's important to have a few consistent elements. So on local streets, vertical elements like the street trees and street lights tie the city together while the surface and other small scale features reflect the character of neighborhoods. So next I'll discuss gateways and thresholds, which articulate the sense of arrival along the streetscape. The capital gateways are shown here in orange, <clears throat> consistent with the urban design elements demarcation of gateways or entries into the monumental core. Thresholds are shown in the light orange arrows at important entries into or between character areas or neighborhoods. The gateways and thresholds may have distinct treatments within the public realm to signal entry or transition, helping to achieve a welcoming capital city identity and distinguish the unique character of neighborhoods. Here are some examples of gateways and thresholds. Um, the character area threshold to the Smithsonian Museum sub area from 10th Street is shown on the left, and the Capitol Gateway at Union Station is seen from Columbus Circle is shown on the right. So in summary, this urban design streetscape framework will be used to develop guidelines and construction details in the next phases of work in early 2019. It will also be the foundation for the conceptual lighting framework, which we will be presenting to you in December. I'll briefly discuss the conceptual lighting framework components and our next steps in the project timeline. You may remember in May, Catherine Ruse and Judah Gluckman briefed you on the city's smart street lighting project. The project is currently in the procurement phase and we are coordinating our work with them to ensure a comprehensive approach to changing the lighting character throughout the city. To begin the lighting framework, we looked at several lighting plans developed between 1923 and 1992. The 1923 plan focused on fixture design and lighting levels. The 1977 plan focused on lighting Pennsylvania Avenue and was supplemented by the 87 plan which focused on building lighting. And the 1992 plan developed by CFA focused on highlighting the LaFont plant structure. So using the city's street lighting history, we're examining the role that street lighting plays in focusing views to illuminated civic structures or highlighting streets and reservations, and considering how street light fixtures should continue to unify and express the dignity of the capital city. So here are several proposed components for the conceptual lighting framework, which include a hierarchy among mon monuments, memorials, and civic buildings, this is a categorization of the city's nationally significant illuminated structures like the Capitol Building and Washington Monument, and a hierarchy among open spaces and streets, which is a categorization of the capital city's parks, open spaces, and streets which were identified in the urban design framework. 
Uh, symbolic connections. This identifies streets that symbolically link nationally significant structures or open spaces, which may require special lighting considerations and further guidance. And lastly, street light bulb color temperature and brightness principles, which provide general guidance on the appearance of street light bulbs within their fixtures, as well as the quality of light emitted from the bulb. To review the project timeline, we're finishing up the streetscape framework and currently working on the conceptual lighting framework. We anticipate returning to the commission in December with the full urban design framework for review and request to release for public comment. So in conclusion today, we're seeking your comments or concurrence on the 1992 ban uh, boundary adjustment, the streetscape framework, including how we've categorized streets and character areas and how these contribute to the capital city's identity, and the lighting framework components. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Question on the stable. Um, thank you very much um, for the presentation, and I want to apologize. I, did, I wasn't able to talk to Beth before she was off, um, but I, I, I have a, a couple of sort of, not concerns, but I just want to raise them, is, I think I showed this before, that the urban context for streetscape is not just the sidewalk and the trees, and at least NCPC has been giving so much guidance now around, um, you know, the African American memorial being, you know, being a different type of design, or Smithsonian, like, like we've just been giving so much more guidance about the utility and the intersection of the design of the built environment and the streetscape, that I'm not sort of seeing a recognition of the evolution of how we design memorials, how we use them, the National Mall since the last time this was done. And so if there just, this may need to be a recognition of you know, the Corcoran now is actually a school. It's not just a museum, and it's evolving to something else. We're pushing the Smithsonian to think about the, you know, this some more. We're seeing strong design. We're, you know, I just, I don't, I don't understand the built environment context, which informs the streetscape context. So I just really encourage you to think about that or for us to have some relation. Um, and then there'll be two more things now is for Judiciary Square, just... Um, there are some significant district properties there right now, you know, where the, the daily building is about to go out for RFP. Um, um, we're trying to figure out do with 441. So um, as we think about those things, um, you know, the hope for me is we could have done all this a little bit earlier, right? I mean, so we're finishing the, the National Law Enforcement Memorial. We're about to do the daily building with Judiciary Square. And these guidelines are coming out. So how much can we sort of um, um, preview these ideas in a way to make sure we get some cohesion on um, the Wamana buildings coming up possibly for sale? So there's a lot of things that are happening there so much that I don't want to, in the end, stop and everything's underway. And now there's some guidelines that are coming through that may sort of inhibit the progress. So as we think about the timing, how can we pilot? Um, and then finally, the last thing is that goes the same way for 10th Street. So there's a lot of conversations right now, I think, with NCPC and the Southwest Bid and Deputy Mayor for Planning's office and our office about how to pilot um, 10th Street into being something fun and active. And I just don't want us in the end to be in the middle of a planning process and we're not we're we're inhibited by testing ideas as that's starting to happen. So hopefully, as we think about this, we're playing and we're informing the planning process versus you know being told after we've tested something that's successful that in a larger planning process that doesn't work anymore. So that's just some of the. Thank you. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll say is it is cultural plan. So far, the cultural plan for D.C., we, as we said, all infrastructure is a stage. Every resident's a performer. We talked a lot about for Southwest how the Hirshhorn let the dots bleed out into these streets. And so I just don't see the – I hope there's a space for whimsy and a space for um, learning from memorials from the future. Just what's the what's – the, how, do, how is the streetscape a canvas for sort of showing the evolution of the use of space, um, sort of inclusivity of space, of comfort of space, just a lot of how people use it versus the aesthetics and how we want the streetscapes to also be part of the 
the monumentality and memorialness and identity versus sort of like a height and a planner box and a this and a that. Like just, we've done so much thinking about this. I just want to make sure we're, we're pushing ourselves that way. Sorry, you guys. So think about programming and the intersection of buildings and open spaces and how people traverse through. Yeah. You, you said that in three sentences better than I could. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Shaw, I have a question. What's the status of your street light program, your initiative? Um, I think, Evan, would you know better? I can get back to you on that. I'm not sure. I was curious since we were talking about that. I'm not sure. I know it's still part of the P3 concept, yeah. and I know there's been some parts of design, but. I, my understanding, possibly in the next year, we'll finally get the, because the RFP will eventually come to the council because it's a P3. So that's so. OP3, and we're OP. So. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I understand. So it's got some ways to go. Uh, yeah, Mr. Gallus. Thank you, Ms. Spiegel. As, uh, this is an important body of work. Um, it really is uh, uh, amazing how it, we can organize uh, such a, a large landscape, uh, a cityscape, uh, in a way that gives it a, a sort of a, an order, a framework that uh, I think makes uh, operating within the city and decision making, such as Mr. Shaw was describing, a, at least a little more understandable in its context. And so uh, I'm really proud that the Commission is doing this work uh, and uh, look forward to um, seeing it continue to evolve. I, I have one part of this that I didn't see in here that I got scared a few months ago with this small small cell structure discussion, um, particularly as it relates to the streetscape um, framework. Uh, it seems to me that this will be a very significant impact on what we see there as a very rational and orderly street section and sort of concepts for uh, what what should be in the street, what should be in the sidewalk. I, I like what Mr. Shaw had to say also, but can you comment on that? And I have one more after that, please. I'm going to, I'll answer this one. Um, we are working very closely with the Department of Transportation, actually DCOP and Commission of Fine Arts on trying to address the very concerns you've expressed. Uh, we are concerned as well, uh, can, collectively, I think everyone but we also know that this is a necessary infrastructure uh, that's coming, and so how can we place it in our public open spaces in a way that it can function, but it also doesn't mar um, our function and beauty of the capital. So just a quick overview of where we are. Uh, DDOT released a very preliminary set of guidelines on August 24th. There's actually a public meeting tonight with all of the ANC members um, and some others between DDOT, the providers, the internet provider or the cellular providers and um, the, some of the public members of public. We are attending that as well. Um, they will, they, there's going to be, they're going to be going before CFA with these uh, draft guidelines in middle of October. We're going to be coming back to you in early November and that will be the first time. We do expect that we'll be coming back again. Um, and we are looking at an approach, um, particularly within the monumental core and the areas of most where we have the greatest federal interest on how we, first of all, how we're different from the rest of the city. But, and just, I guess, one interesting point, from what we understand, downtown is where, where these providers most want to go. But it's also where we have probably the most regular um, consistent streetscapes, and when we start applying criteria, it's going to get challenging. So we are also testing these guidelines right now. So when we come back to you in November, we hope to have a very robust um, analysis of the guidelines and suggestions on how we might, you know, continue to further develop them. Thank you. Okay. That's, That's the big picture. I, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'll either be hiding under the desk or I'm not sure which. Um, and then I guess my last observation really is about number one, the boundary adjustment. Um, I just want to say I don't know as much about the finer grain of judiciary square particularly, but 
as it relates to the Kennedy Center and Banneker Park, that uh, it's 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 uh, it's sort of a um, personal pride that we've had input on interventions in those two areas uh, in in recent months, and now to see them be incorporated as part of uh, the monumental core is is a pretty exciting thing. So I, I, I welcome that for whatever it's worth. Thank you. Mr. Bay. Uh, yeah, with a few thoughts on this. And, and we've been active in providing comments as the process has been going through. And I think we've, we haven't necessarily given you very clear messages in terms of a Park Service position on this, but we've been providing feedback along the way. Um, the, I, I have a, a f just a comment or a question actually to start with. I mean, the 1992 Streetscape Manual, how big of a document is that actually? I want to say it's about 75 pages. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we all need to keep in mind is that this is less of sort of a high design um, effort than it is a very practical manual for how. Uh, our designers, uh, when they're working on projects in our in our buildings and our in our public spaces, um, it, it's a reference manual for them, and it is a very useful tool for that purpose, especially when people actually do pay attention to it and uh, it makes it easier for them to get NCPC approvals. Um, but it also makes it easier. I mean, it's it, you know, particularly with the projects that we undertake sometimes where we're dealing with. Um, in some cases, almost a blank slate, uh, having a few less decisions to make can actually uh, help them focus on the things that are really important within a given project. Uh, I also think it's it's important to keep it simple. I mean, at 75 pages, you're already pushing the limit of what is practical and useful as a reference manual. Um, so I wouldn't want it to get over complicated. Um, the um, I think that the, in terms of the expansions, um, I, the Kennedy Center is the one that makes the most sense to me immediately uh, because we really need to do things to try to tie that in more closely to the monumental core. It really should be part of it and it's a shame that it's, that it has been sort of severed by the, the freeways and bridges and so on. Uh, so I think that that's, a, that is an important addition. Um, Banneker is a little bit more questionable, not that it, that it shouldn't be unified, but it really is at a transitional moment to a, a very different kind of atmosphere. And I think that the, the waterfront has evolved into something very different. And the future of Banneker as a potential development site, I think, is more likely to be of that character than it is of the memorial character or the monumental core character. So I'm not totally sold on that. I also don't think that it's changing anytime soon and when it does change there'll be an opportunity for this commission to weigh in completely on what happens there so it's not it's not really important that it is in it's also not really important if it's not in I think at this point Judiciary Square is a, is a different animal because while there are those um, more um, I guess monumental components of it going all the way up to the the building museum. Um, it's it, it 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 very much is um, you know a, a a section of the the city independent of the monumental core. And I think I'm you know I share some of the questions that that uh, um, Commissioner Shaw had about how well that marries in when you think about you know, some of the more mundane buildings like 441 4th Street, does that really, is it really critical that that be, you know, have that same monumental core streetscape approach? I'm not sure that it, that it does. I think it's more like many of the other downtown neighborhoods. Um, and uh, I think I share the concern about how all this pulls, works together with the uh, um, the small cell infrastructure, however, that gets implemented, um, and I'll be, you know, I'll be under the desk with you hiding <laughs> when that comes back, because uh, I'm not sure where that's going to wind up. 
Um, I think that one of the things that we that is very important to to think about when it comes to the streetscape manual is it's that it's one of those things that almost nobody knows that it exists, but everyone feels the benefit of it. Everyone walking down the street, you know, they get a better experience because of what has been done there. That we don't have this, you know, overly motley collection of stuff in the street. I mean, we have some motley stuff, but <laughs> it's still it's a lot better, uh, and it's sort of an invisible. It's an invisible hand kind of helping make things better. And I appreciate uh, all the effort that's going into it and into the update. And we just urge that we don't overcomplicate it. That's all. Uh, Mr. Cash. Uh, I'd just kind of like to piggyback on that as well. I think that in looking at the original 1992 map, it kind of struck me being someone that worked on DC statehood efforts over the years. It actually very closely resembles what the city's position is that we hope will eventually become the new District of Columbia and the rest of us will become a state. So I think that's one of the, the good things about the current boundaries. I would echo the concerns and comments on Judiciary Square. I mean, if we made every part of the city part of this core because we thought that eventually the Supreme Court or some other federal building was going to go there, we'd have a lot of the city that we'd be, for historic reasons, calling part of the core. But I mean, there's really nothing in Judiciary Square that I would consider federal other than the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I mean, that's, and I think there's the FBI. Well, I mean, there, you have 441, you have the D.C. Court of Appeals, you have the D.C. Superior Court, you have Daly. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot of, D, uh, yeah, I mean, you have uh, at Metro is, would, I think, fall in that boundary. So I would just be cautious in, in looking at that because I understand the historic significance and a lot of the tie-in. I mean, I don't know what the U.S. Court of Appeals originally was. It was at one point it was the D.C. City County, or I mean the D.C. District City Building. County. I think um, I'm not sure what else was originally intended from there. But if you look at the character of it now, it has kind of that federal feel, I think. But if you look at a lot of the functionality, it's actually kind of our second municipal core outside of the very tiny little Wilson Building. So I would just urge you to to look at that. I'm not necessarily against it, but because I think there is some of that feel. But it, I mean, it really is part part of the district. Um, and also on the boundaries, I think Kennedy Center would be a great addition. Um, it really pulls it in, um, and because of the work we've been doing with it. But in looking at some of these other maps that you went over, where it wouldn't technically be part of the core, but it's these areas that seems like with the MOU, you want to have a lot of consultation with the district. You have some of these radiating roads going up to, to Thomas Circle, to Logan Circle, to DuPont Circle. And I understand there's some significance with the radiating areas of those, and you're all whenever you're within the original LaFont City, I think that there's something to be said for that. But a lot of these areas, like in DuPont, we're about to build, uh, we're about to, to cover up one of the overpasses there and build a back, brand new park. We already have like these special little sidewalks that you walk on and they develop electricity for these semi-ugly lights that are there. But I mean, there's, there's all these kind of very unique things in all these neighborhoods. When you go down to the waterfront, I guess that the, the urban design term would be like placemaking. And I think there's a tension between trying to have some consistency and making sure that we're flowing versus going up to like Ninth and U now, where there's all this great new development and the streetscape is very different than it is when you go down to an older neighborhood like DuPont. So the thing that struck me in looking at this, especially as you go farther into Capitol Hill and farther to the north from the White House, I just be careful that it's very clear in any MOUs and when we're talking about guidance, that when we're outside of that downtown core, this is DC, these are distinct DC neighborhoods. I don't need to have anything that looks like the legislative branch of Supreme Court out, literally outside of my house up in Thomas Circle. I mean, that's one of the things I love about walking north of Pennsylvania Avenue. I feel like I'm out of the federal city and I'm, I'm kind of home. So I think that, that those sensitivities to the very local characteristics of a lot of these areas that you're looking to kind of mash into this. I mean, it's it's clear it's not going to be as, as kind of rigid as what you're thinking with the, the actual core area, but seeing all this pink and, and colors kind of radiating out, it makes me a little wary that we're, we want to turn the entire LaFont city into some kind of more cohesion than we necessarily need, especially given the really distinct urban um, context of each of the different parts of the city. So that's kind of my, my broader comment is when you're looking outside the, the core, very light touch, and I'm sure that OP will will emphasize that and, and make sure that we're kind of we're, make sure that we're not looking Capitol Hill like we are in Dupont Circle or anywhere else. So that's kind of my two cents on on the boundaries. Um, uh, I've talked to some folks about the the uh, small cell stuff. I'm anxious to to have that conversation continue. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some local hearings on that uh, with the city. But um, I think that that'll be a, a good piece of this before we get to the next stage of of this review. So thank you. Other comments? 
Well, thank you. Our very quick meeting turned a little bit longer. <laughs> I know. Than I thought. Started off with a bang. Yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, your sensing comments. no further action, we're adjourned.